Well, what a great crowd. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. And I'm just really happy to be here, believe me. This has been a great rebranding of the limelight. Am I holding this right now? OK. And uh, it's been a lot of work to do this, but a lot of fun. And I want to thank the Mikasich family for letting me do this, for, for putting up all my baseball history. This is like a museum to me. This is great. And also for making me feel like part of the Mikasich family. It's been, it's been a wonderful time. I need to thank some of my, my people that helped me with the historical aspects. Tom Crisp, who's going to be the next speaker after me. Uh, Rick Cabral, who's always helpful and has a website called Baseball Sacramento, so you should check that out. Chris Lango's been helpful, and he's our videographer today. And um, also Jane, she took my somewhat boring baseball history and these great images and turned it into art. If you guys look on the walls, it's great stuff. Now, yay, yeah. hey, hey Jane. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, the way this works is if you come up here later and you walk around looking at these and you read all these captions, you're going to get the history of old time Sacramento baseball all the way out to 1960 with this picture of Kuno Berrigan catching for the Solons. So my thing is old time Sacramento baseball. And I know that's probably a little dry for some people, so I'll try to, try to rush through it a bit. But I grew up in the Hollywood Park area of Sacramento, attended Solon games as a kid, went to McClatchy, played some sports there, tried to. Um, and I've always had a an interest in Sacramento uh, history. And so being the Solon's historian just kind of fell in my lap. I love it. I love it. So. I think most people don't know that baseball's been played in Sacramento since the gold rush. It came out with the gold rush because people brought their customs, they brought their cook, how they cooked, they brought everything, their pastime. So baseball was here with the gold rush. Now there's stories of uh, Alexander Cartwright coming out and spreading baseball all the way to Hawaii, coming through Sacramento and whatnot, like Johnny Appleseed. It's probably a, just a story, but he was here and, and that's kind of interesting. But the actual first account, the first factual account we have of baseball was in Sacramento in 1859 in the Sacramento Union. So it does go back quite a ways. And in those days, though, it was a gentleman's game. It was played on Sunday. You, you just put an announcement in the paper, said, I got, I got eight guys. We'll meet you down at the park, and you go play. So it wasn't that big a deal. But all of a sudden, teams started forming, and then they started having leagues, and it became more than a gentleman's game, because you might be a gentleman that owned a business, but you notice some of the guys working on the loading dock were pretty strong and pretty good athletes, and all of a sudden they're on your team, and they didn't have to work as hard after that. And then, then there was a lot of gambling going on, and competition and gambling, and all of a sudden the game's becoming what we call semi-pro. There's a little money involved. So by the 1860s, we've got leagues, we've got some semi-pro ball, and in 1871, uh, the first uh, league was formed. The first professional league was the National Association, which five years later became the National League. Now, the first professional baseball team was the 1869 Cincinnati Reds. And that's the same year they opened the Transcontinental Railroad. And they were on the train that summer, later in the summer, and came out here, got off the train, took a steamship, because that's how you went to San Francisco in those days, went down, played some teams down there, trounced them, came back to Sacramento, played our all-star team, beat them 50 to 6. So <laughs> baseball's been here a while, but we haven't always won all the games. So um, well, going into the 1870s, we still have leagues forming, semi-pro. And, and back east, you've got a few more professional leagues starting. And we had some semi-pro leagues forming in California. But by 1883, it became a truly professional sport, part of organized baseball. The California League started in 1883 in the Bay Area. We had teams in San Francisco and Oakland. LA was too small still and too far away. They hadn't taken all the water from the Owens Valley, so it was a desert still. And anyway. <laughs> um, but in 1886, our top semi-pro team, the Altas, Alta is an old term for Northern California. So the Sacramento Altas joined the California League. Um, so they were fairly competitive. We didn't win any championships. And that's the first picture right over here on the wall is the Altas. One of the, we, and every time you start talking baseball, there's always great little side stories. They're starting shortstop. If you look down at some of Jane's artwork, is Billy Newbert. 
Newbert's Hardware Store. I think we all went there to get whatever we needed back before it closed in 1993. So um, it was called the Altus, and in 1890 they changed it to the Senators, because this is the state capital. So they, they've, they've come and gone with that state capital theme. But baseball, here we are in a, in a restaurant and a bar. There's always been some crossover with alcohol. And um, it's nice to have it again today. I think beer and baseball go together. I think they really do. But as we go into the late uh, 1890s, in the middle of the 1890s, there was a depression. So they, most sports stopped. The California League stopped. The Sac Sacramento Center just went away. But 1898, the California League was back. And guess what? Sacramento had a team in there called the Gilt Edge. And uh, some of you are holding Gilt Edge beer. There's a can right over there. And the team right behind Jane over here was called the Gilt Edge. That was the team in the California League. And they were also called the Brewers, just like the Milwaukee Brewers. So we had that team. And they won the California League Championship, which was the West Coast. There wasn't another big league out here except that one. Three years in a row, 1898, 1899, 1900. That's, I think we call that a three-peat today. So Sacramento has a real heavy sports history back in those days. So as that team went forward, they realized, well, you can't have a sponsor's name. They changed back to the Senators. So they became the Senators again. And then in, in 1901, they kept playing. 1902, they kept playing. But in 1903, something really big happened. The Pacific Coast League formed. And the very first game was here between Sacramento and the Oakland Oaks, and we won 7-4. We probably should have quit there because we didn't have such good records after that for a while, but uh, very first Coast League game was right here. And at that time, I mean, you know, you can say Major League Baseball now, but up until after World War II, those were just the West Coast Leagues. The Pacific Coast League was the third Major League, and it was recognized by many folks as being just as competitive. You know, Joe Marty was with the Phillies. He came back to Sacramento because they paid him more. And he's quoted as saying, the competition is just as good, and they pay me more. And maybe the pitching's not quite as good, but I get just, I'm a big, small, a big fish in a small pond. But anyway, so we continue on. And in 1903, while we're in the Pacific Coast League, we're still a small market. And what happens in small markets? It's kind of like the Kings thing. They almost go away. I mean, you, you know about the, the Sacramento Kings here and what's going on and you're coming and going with that. Well, our team, the Sacramento Senators, after 1903, went to Tacoma. The state of Washington keeps trying to steal Sacramento sports teams. And they won the Pacific Coast League Championship in 1904 with the same guys we had here in 03. And uh, they stayed up there for a couple of years. Meantime, we didn't have professional sports again, or pro professional baseball team until 1906. And we had a team in the California State League, which was an outlaw league, but it was still a top-level league. And that name of that team was the, the Cordovas. And it wasn't Rancho Cordova, because Rancho Cordova didn't exist then. It was named after, here we go, alcohol again, a, a wine called Cordova Wine. And that was one of the sponsors. But it was our professional team. It'd be like going to River Cats game tonight. You go, to the, you go out and see the Cordovas play. And so we've got them up on the wall as well. Now, they played as the Cordovas for two years and changed back again to the Senators. They keep going back to the Senators. So in 1908, the, Calif the Sacramento Senators in the California State League. Well, Charlie Graham had been with the team a lot. And Charlie Graham went on later to own the Seals and was very a major player with the Seals. He sold Joe DiMaggio to the Yankees later on. But he was in Sacramento at that time. And so he got the team back in 1909, back into the Pacific Coast League. So we got back into the better league, the third major league, the Pacific Coast League, where we stayed all the way through 1914. But in 1910, something, another big event happened. Edmonds Field, a lot of folks remember Edmonds Field, Riverside and Broadway. It started out as Buffalo Park. And Buffalo Park was co-sponsored by the Buffalo Brewery. So we have another cut over to, to, to alcohol, if you will. But the most interesting thing in my mind is it was set up by a former Gilt Edge player named Ed Cripp. And Ed Cripp knew what he was doing because at that time, Broadway was called Y Street. It was also a levee, and the road went along the top because when flood season came, they wanted everything south of there to flood because there wasn't anything out there. 
So they went from the wide street levee and you walked down into Buffalo Park. But the best thing was there was also the city limit and you could sell beer at the ballpark. They couldn't do it in, yeah, yeah. So, and also the, the, uh, the enforcement of gambling laws out there was a little laxer. So anyway, so the ballpark's out there, Riverside and Broadway, and we're going through history, but we're a small market team again. And after, about halfway through the 1914 season, the team just picked up in the middle of the night, kind of like the, I think the Indianapolis Colts had done one time, and moved to San Francisco as the missions and finished out the 1914 season. Now, the fans weren't crazy about this. And uh, they became the Salt Lake City Bees in 1915. Now, 1915, 16, and 17, we didn't have professional teams, but we did have baseball. And Tom Crisp, the next speaker, will talk about some of the really good caliber semi-pro ball that was going on in those days and started off what became ultimately the winter leagues and some of the busher leagues that uh, people like Pete Mikasich and Kuno Berrigan played in as well. So anyway, 1918, Charlie Graham comes back and, and steals the team basically from Portland. We get basically the Portland Beavers come and they become the Solons and they stuck around in 1960. Yeah. And, and actually the official name then was still the Senators. They're the Senators up to 1935. But you're a sports writer and you don't have that enough room in the paper, you call them the Solons, because that was a nickname for a legislator. Now they also had other names at times, like the Sacks, S-A-C-T-S, and when Harry Wolverton managed them, they called them the Wolves. There's a little token in this little frame up here. It says the Wolves schedule. So they did a lot of things with nicknames that we don't really do much anymore. Um, so here we are up to 1918, 1920 comes along, and uh, we got the Mooring era, and we got Charlie Mooring here. Yeah, and I think we've got some relatives in the group here, right here. We've got Mooring's grandson, Lou Mooring and Charlie Mooring. Yeah, yeah. And we had, we had, yeah, it's right there, right here, yeah. And Lou Mooring was a smart man. He hired Charlie Doyle, who had played for years here, as the general manager. And between the two of them, they brought a lot of talent out of Sacramento. But the problem was, small market, they had to sell them. Like Stan Hack, probably the best player to come out of Sacramento. We had to sell them to the Cubs just to make, you know, to, so we could get to the next season with the rest of the team. And then we go along into the 1930s. We have the Depression. Mooring loses the team. But the, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals buy the team. And Branch Rickey sets up one of the first farm systems. So we're a, a farm team of the St. Louis Cardinals. You can see one of the uniforms down there. It's got an S and a Cardinal. So this is Sacramento Solons. And also they changed the name officially to Solons from Senators at that time. So we're now officially the Senators. And as we go through time, the teams get better. We're, we're getting some talent from the Cardinals. And we get our next, we get our very first uh, until the Rivercats came, Pacific Coast League Championship in 1942. And I want you to come read about Tony Freitas because he actually won the last two games of this seven game series. We were down five games, or down four games with five to go, and we beat the Los Angeles Angels. And they were heavily favored to beat us. But the war came along, and guess what happened? They took all the ball players and they had to go fight, they had to go fight the war basically. So baseball,